The human body is one of the most common forms of visual art. As a subject, it offers endless expressive possibilities, and it allows us to reflect upon, to come to terms with, and to greater understand ourselves. Um, because our notions of beauty are formed by personal experiences and societal or cultural standards, artistic depictions of the human body often reflect how beauty can mean something very different uh, depending on the location or the time period in which a work was made. Um, now, the human body can be more than just the subject of an artwork, however. It can also serve as the medium or the material used to create the work, or it can simply participate in an artwork through performance, dance, ritual, etc. Some of the earliest known works of art made during the prehistoric era were self-contained human figurines. Now these have been found around the world and they seem to have been some of the most common objects in some of the world's oldest civilizations. The majority of these figurines date to the Upper Paleolithic era, which is from about 40,000 to about 10,000 BCE. And the majority of these figurines appear to be female. Discovered in Austria in the early 20th century, the woman of Willendorf is one of the most well-known and one of the earliest examples of these prehistoric female figurines. This dates to about 24,000 BCE. Standing on almost non-existent feet at just four and three-eighths inches tall, this carved limestone figurine features exaggerated female attributes. Um, these include pendulous breasts, a large round belly, wide hips, full thighs and buttocks, and a clearly defined vulva. She also wears a sort of patterned textile or maybe a braided hairstyle atop her head, but her face does not have any facial features. Um, her head seems to tilt forward slightly, but we don't see any eyes, a nose, a mouth, anything like that. She has very small arms. Um, just a few kind of small details across the body, and the artist here has really taken advantage of the natural texture and shape of this piece of limestone. Um, in fact, they've incorporated a natural indent in the stone um, and transformed it into the deep belly button in the center of the abdomen here. The clear emphasis on female anatomy that is present in so many of these prehistoric figurines has resulted in scholars sort of interpreting these as fertility figures. Um, they've sort of argued that these may have been used as charms to encourage pregnancy or as teaching tools. Um, maybe these were ways in which um, women were celebrated as mothers and as the bringers of life. Um, but this interpretation has also um, sort of been expounded upon by the fact that many early scholars referred to these as Venus figurines um, in reference to Venus, the Roman goddess of love and beauty. The label Venus was first applied in 1863 when the French archaeologist Marquis Paul de Vibre discovered the first of these prehistoric figurines. Um, he discovered this at a site near Lagier Basset in France, and um, he sort of playfully reversed this nickname that had been given to a very popular statue type um, from ancient Greece and, and Rome, which depicted the goddess Venus, um, often trying to conceal her breasts or her pubic area from view, um, almost in a way that made her seem sort of modest or shy. And so this type of statue was nicknamed the Venus Pudica, or the Modest Venus. And so Marquis here kind of reverses that name and calls this 
prehistoric figurine, the Venus impudica, or the immodest Venus. Um, his inference is that the prehistoric Venus is making no attempt to hide her sexuality, and so is therefore um, clearly an immodest and erotic being. And so eventually scholars began to refer to these figurines collectively as Venus figurines. But what kind of message does that send? We already have this um, assumed idea that these are representing the ideals of womanhood, of fertility, or maybe just um, female bodily or beauty ideals. Um, we have this implication that these are erotic objects. And now when associating them with the Roman goddess of love and beauty, Venus, um, that sort of underscores the idea that these are erotic or sexual objects meant to be viewed for pleasure. Um, and it maybe even kind of creates this assumed association with religious beliefs, uh, maybe some sort of association with um, deities or goddesses, um, maybe even an association with matriarchal societies. Um, and so this is a good example of how words are just invented symbols for ideas, and words can both reveal and shape how we view the world or the ways in which we think about the world. It's certainly possible that um, a well-nourished body would have represented health and even fertility for prehistoric women. Um, but more recent research has argued that amply proportioned female figures denote accumulated knowledge, experience, and continuity across generations, and that these figurines are meant to be older women um, rather than younger ones who have sort of uh, sagging skin, wrinkles, um, which are meant to reflect their wisdom and their experience. But what would that mean for the Venus impudica or this um, sort of skinny um, female figurine that doesn't seem to match the others? Um, well, Perhaps these were used as teaching tools for young women to kind of show them um, the ways in which the female body changes throughout her lifetime. Um, maybe the um, thin female figures are meant to be young women, maybe prepubescent women even, and um, then the more exaggerated female forms are meant to be pregnant women or even just elderly women with sagging skin and wisdom and experience. Um, some other facts that have led scholars to kind of interpret these differently are the facts that the postures and the tiny feet on many of these figures would not allow them to stand alone. And most of these are quite small in size. Um, they can usually fit within the palm of your hand. And so they would have been portable, uh, tradable even. Um, they would have demanded sort of a, a very personal level of engagement. And oftentimes the materials that these figurines are made of, for example, the woman of Willendorf was made of limestone um, that was not native to the region in which it was found. Um, so this means that either the raw stone or the finished figurine was transported to that location at some point or another. Um, and then, of course, we have the similarities between these figurines that have been discovered across a wide area of Europe and even in other parts of the world, all dating to roughly the same era. And so some scholars use this information to argue that these were subtle forms of nonverbal communication between isolated groups of Paleolithic peoples, and that they would trade these to signify friendliness or maybe a willingness to interact, to ally, or to intermarry between the groups. 
Another more recent theory argues that perhaps these figurines were made by women as some sort of self-portraits. Um, this argument is presented by uh, Catherine McCoy and Leroy McDermott in their article Toward Decolonizing Gender, Female Vision in the Upper Paleolithic, um, which was published in 1996 in the American Anthropologist Journal. Um, in this article, the two authors argue that the over-exaggerated um, body proportions stem from the ways in which a woman would view herself by looking down at her own body. They describe this as the foreshortening effect of self-inspection. And so from a woman's view of her own body, these figurines become a bit more naturalistic um, than they seem to be if we think about them being created by an artist who was looking at the female figure from an outside perspective. Um, this would also explain why these figures usually lack facial features. Um, without any sort of reflective surface, the woman would not be able to um, see what her own head and face look like and so they would have only based them off of you know what other women's faces and heads looked like um, or maybe based on what their own faces and heads felt like to their hands um, so that would explain why the bodies themselves are given a bit more attention than the faces In the 1950s, the Dutch-born American artist Willem de Kooning um, made a series of paintings of women that incorporate very bold and almost aggressive or even violent marks and slashing brush strokes. Now, de Kooning was an abstract expressionist, um, and so that sort of helps to explain his very gestural painting style here. Um, but he said that this woman series referred to, quote, the female painted through all the ages, all those idols. Um, so here in de Kooning's Woman Number 1, he shows us a, um, a very exaggerated form and places emphasis on characteristically female elements of human anatomy. Um, and sort of visually connects this modern artwork to previous depictions of the female form, including prehistoric figurines like the woman of Willendorf. Um, this is a large painting that was, of course, made thousands of years after that tiny sculpture was created, but the most prominent parts of the body are the breasts, while the arms and the legs are minimized in a manner that is quite similar to the woman of Willendorf and some of those other female figurines. There is sort of a sense of the inherent power of women in both artworks, women as givers and protectors of life. However, they are still quite different from one another. De Kooning's woman is very large, uh, sort of physically imposing. The canvas itself is over life size. It's about six feet three and seven eighths inches tall. Um, and so it sort of makes literal the very larger than life feeling that is conveyed by the woman of Willendorf sculpture. Um, now de Kooning's painting also features um, glaring eyes and a sort of toothy grinning mouth of the woman's face at the top of the composition, whereas the woman of Willendorf and most of those prehistoric female figurines do not include facial features at all. And then if you would like to compare uh, de Kooning's woman's facial features with those of um, more traditional depictions of, say, the goddess Venus, there's sort of a stark contrast. Again, de Kooning's woman is almost ferocious or terrifying rather than the soft sort of um, quote unquote feminine um, facial features and gaze that are shown on Venus. Um, now, both de Kooning's woman and um, the woman of Willendorf and other prehistoric figurines feature a sort of abstracted human form. 
Um, and this is sort of visible in the rough shapes that are used to create the woman of Willendorf and then the jagged brush strokes that are featured in de Kooning's Woman One. Um, the appearances here make them less representations of individual people and more reflections of universal ideas about powerful women. And as de Kooning's statement suggests, uh, woman number one embodies the female through all of the ages, uh, not just the present. The ways in which artists depict the human body are dependent on notions of beauty. Now, ideas about beauty differ between cultures, between time periods, locations, etc. For example, the ancient Greeks believed that beauty was a direct function of proper proportion. Um, they based their notions of beauty on the combination of an underlying canon of mathematical proportions and the finely honed physiques possessed by male athletes who competed in the nude. Um, so here we're looking at a sculpture. This is actually a Roman marble copy of an original Greek bronze sculpture, which dates to about 450 BCE. Um, but the artist's name is Polykleitos of Argos, and this is his Doriferous or his spear bearer. Um, so this sculpture was created to demonstrate the perfect or ideal proportions of the human figure. Each part of the body is a common fraction of the figure's total height. Uh, the height of the head is one eighth of the body. The breadth of the shoulders is one fourth of the height of the body. Now, the Greek emphasis on beauty and honesty conveyed in the nude human form is also apparent here. The artist has used nudity to reflect on the observations and their knowledge of anatomy um, in a way that a clothed body could perhaps not do. Um, you can also see beauty ideas based on um, most, excuse me, the most desirable physical attributes. Uh, for the Greeks, these would have been smooth skin, regular facial features, and of course, the bodies of male athletes, so very sort of muscular or physically fit. Um, and once more, these athletes often competed in the nude to sort of show off their physical power and to intimidate other competitors.
In ancient Greece, it was far more common to see a male nude figure than a female nude figure. However, by about the 4th century BCE, the female nude had begun to gain a certain level of respectability. Now, many years later, during the Renaissance, Italian artists such as Sandro Botticelli began to revive the appearance of the female nude as it had been depicted in late antiquity. The female nude became an acceptable subject for works of art, so long as it appeared in a historical or mythological context. Now, according to classical mythology, Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, first emerged from the sea as a fully formed adult on a shell. And this is the moment that Botticelli is depicting here in his painting, The Birth of Venus. This painting is monumental in size. It's about five feet, eight inches by about nine feet, two inches. Um, and a female nude of this scale had not really been seen in Europe since antiquity. So this was um, quite shocking for some, I would imagine. Um, Venus is shown in the center of the composition, standing in a sort of graceful um, contrapposto pose. She has all her weight sort of placed on one leg, and the other leg is bent slightly at the knee in a relaxed position, which gives her body this sort of elegant S curve. Um, she sort of discreetly covers her nudity, kind of indicating that modesty or chastity is part of her appeal. Um, and she is sort of modeled after the modest Venus sculptures that we saw just a few um, slides ago. But she's standing on her shell being um, blown into the shore by the wind god Zephyr. Um, he is accompanied by the earth nymph Chloris, his partner, and then awaiting Venus on the shoreline is a goddess or nymph, perhaps the goddess of spring, um, but waiting to wrap her in this cloak or blanket covered in flowers. Um, now Venus has very smooth ivory colored skin, long flowing hair, and then again she is positioned in this quite um, elegant yet modest pose. Um, so the graceful shape and the flawless quality of her body are meant to reflect the purity of the newborn goddess and create this um, harmonious and pleasing composition. Now it may seem a little um, contradictory that if modesty or chastity is meant to be part of the appeal here, why would we show her nude in the first place? Well, during the Renaissance, um, there was an idea that nudity was the most sort of pure or innocent way of being and that it could reflect a sense of divine love. And so by admiring or seeing this sort of physical beauty, not necessarily in a sexual way, um, although she does have that side as well, um, it can cause the viewer to sort of experience this divine love or um, to have a greater appreciation for the nobility of the human body, which is God's sort of finest creation. But because Botticelli has modeled his figure here on an ancient sculpture, he has based his conception of beauty on classical Greek standards. Many African cultures believe that beauty is more than just external appearance and that it involves internal or societal principles as well. Being calm, wise, and composed, for example, were important traits for kings of the ancient city of Ile Ife. Now this city existed in the country of Nigeria and it's believed to be home to the ancestral Yoruba peoples. Um, the Yoruba peoples are still occupying um, Nigeria today. In fact, they are the largest ethnic group in the country. Um, so this is a terracotta head that dates to about the 12th to 14th centuries. Um, and you can see we have delicate features, sort of elegant line work, this elaborate headdress. Um, all of these things indicate that this is perhaps a king or at least someone of sort of high um, social status. 
Now, the Yoruba people believe that the head is the seat of their life force or their power. And so careful lifelike details are used to sort of draw our attention to the face and the head here. Now, the book suggests that the fine vertical lines that are incised on the face here may be representative of scarification patterns, which are prominent in many African cultures. And these are created by cutting or branding the skin, and they're often considered markers of beauty. However, to my knowledge, the Yoruba king has a sacred status. Um, if you think back to the lecture about um, art and uh, political rulers, we talked about the Yoruba Oba wearing um, the special beaded crown with the beaded veil because he's so sacred and powerful. He cannot be looked at by regular people. Now, again, to my knowledge, this sacred status would not have permitted a knife or a branding tool to touch the king's face. So it's much more likely that the lines here, they do not represent scarification, but rather maybe they represent his veiled um, beaded crown um, or maybe something else. But beauty in this case is a balance of the invisible internal characteristics and then the idealized visible external form. This features very lifelike details. We have, um, you know, plump lips, kind of a full fleshy face. Um, the contours of the nose are very lifelike and clear, the folds of the ears. All of this is extremely naturalistic, but it's also idealized. It's been refined to sort of emphasize the gracefulness of the figure and the sort of calm, wise, and composed uh, personality that this head is meant to reflect. The Bale are Nakan-speaking peoples who inhabit Ghana and the Ivory Coast in West Africa. Now, these peoples, um, they perform a variety of masquerades. However, one of the most common is called an Mblo masquerade. Um, this consists of successive dances that escalate in complexity. Um, and the culminating dance pays tribute to the community's most distinguished members. Um, performers wear small wooden masks paired with a more elaborate cloth costume. And the masks are actually portrait masks. Uh, they take on the same name as the person they represent. Um, generally, they are sort of oval in shape with rather smooth, idealized faces, um, elongated noses, small open mouths, downcast slit eyes, and often you'll see a sort of tall projecting head crest. Many also include scarification patterns along the temples and a very high gloss patina. Now these Mblo portrait masks are not meant to be photographic representations of a certain person, but rather they're meant as a model of that person's accomplishments and their inner beauty, morality, etc. Usually a known individual, often paying tribute to um, the community's most admired members. Um, these can depict men, um, although it's more common that they depict women. Um, men often commission a mask to honor a female relative and to pay homage to her dance skills and to her beauty. Um, Oftentimes in the performance, the person who wears the mask will be accompanied by the person who it represents as well. Um, so here you can see Moya Yanso and her stepson holding her Mblo portrait mask, which he commissioned um, to sort of honor her. Um, according to the art historian, Dr. Perry Klim, um, the stylistic attributes are a visual vocabulary that suggests what it means to be a good, honorable, respected, and beautiful person in Bale society. 
The half-slit eyes and high forehead suggest modesty and wisdom, respectively. The nasolabial folds depicted as a line between the sides of the nose and the outsides of the mouth, and the beard-like projecting triangle patterns that extend from the bottom of the ears to the chin suggest age. The triangular brass additions heighten the lustrous patina when danced in the sunlight, and this is a suggestion of health. Other cultures determine beauty by a person's ability to conform to expectations, be that through their clothes, cosmetics, or their body shape. Um, in Japan, traditional female performers who are known as geisha are renowned for their social skills and artistic talents, such as singing, dancing, or serving tea. Now, these are not courtesans or prostitutes, but they have a very professional relationship with their clients, and they are traditionally strongly discouraged from becoming too intimate with those clients. Now, a geisha's appearance is very specific, and it changes over the course of her career. Um, during the early stages of her career, she wears a rather dramatic hairstyle, heavy makeup, including dark eyeliner and bright red lipstick to make her mouth look small. And then as an apprentice in this stage, the source of her beauty is considered her outward appearance. Later, however, the source of her beauty is derived from her maturity and her gay or her art. Um, so after three years as an apprentice, a geisha wears a less elaborate kimono, which is tied with simpler knots, and she dons lighter makeup and simpler hairstyles. Um, so here we're looking at um, an 18th century print by the artist Kagetsuro Dohan. Um, this is simply titled Beautiful Woman, and this is from the Edo period in Japan. So Edo era artists were interested in depicting the beauties and the pleasures of life, including beautiful women like geishas. And so here, um, the artist sort of emphasizes the impressive attire and the relatively natural appearance, um, which sort of signifies that this is a more mature geisha who would have been appreciated, yes, for her outward appearance, but also for her musical skills, her gift with, um, or excuse me, her gift for uh, kind of intellectual conversation and for her inner beauty and morality as well. While nude figures have long been a subject in the history of art, the tradition of depicting the nude female figure lying down or in a sort of reclining position was established in Western art history during the Renaissance. Now, these types of pictures recall the ancient Greek emphasis on the beauty and honesty conveyed by the nude human form. Um, but in many cases, they also suggest the sensuality of the nude. Now, toilet scenes, um, which portray not a woman on an actual toilet like we would probably think. Um, rather, it's a woman in sort of her dressing room or at her vanity um, preparing themselves for the day, uh, sort of gazing into a mirror, lying in her boudoir, preparing herself to be viewed by the public. Um, these types of pictures allowed artists to portray the female nude in a sort of natural or realistic setting. However, if you remember when we were discussing Botticelli's Birth of Venus, um, it was often only acceptable for the female nude to be depicted in European art in the form of um, a mythological deity, um, most often in the form of the Roman goddess of love and beauty, Venus. Here we're looking at a work by the Venetian painter known as Titian, um, and he was certainly influenced by this classical tradition here. Um, we have a life-sized reclining nude woman. Um, she sort of leans back seductively on this bed covered in rich linens. Um, there's a small dog that sort of sleeps peacefully at her feet, and then this partially open curtain reveals um, a very upper class bedroom with two female attendants in the background. Now, 
our female figure, she gazes directly out at the viewer with the sort of coy or flirty expression. Um, her beautiful golden hair cascades over her shoulders, and her pose seems to be very purposefully sensual. She's sort of strategically positioned herself so that her arm drapes um, over and kind of covers herself modestly, but at the same time, it sort of draws more attention to the fact that she is completely nude. Um, she has voluptuous curves, kind of smooth flowing skin, um, again, a flirty or coy or maybe just pleasant expression and rather inviting body language. Now, during the time that this was painted, Titian worked for the Emperor Charles V. Paintings of beautiful courtesans were quite popular among the men at court. However, it was often required that the artist disguise the courtesan or the nude female woman as the goddess Venus to make it more acceptable. Um, so by implying or suggesting that this painting depicted a mythological figure, Titian was able to sort of explore in depth this secular theme of love and sexuality and desire um, under the guise of a respectable interest in classical antiquity. Here we have a work from 1863. This is the French artist Edward Manet. Um, and here with his Olympia, he's certainly showing us that he was familiar with this tradition of the uh, reclining female nude figure. And in many ways, this seems like somewhat of an homage to Titian's Venus of Urbino. However, there are many um, differences between the two works as well. The composition of the paintings and the postures of the women within them are almost identical. Um, Manet, however, has made several changes. He has um, replaced the sweet sleeping dog with a black cat who is arching its back and hissing at the foot of the bed. Um, he's also changed the servants. Um, instead of having two um, maids in the background, there is an African servant bringing um, the main female figure a large bouquet of flowers. Um, and so in this painting, as in many others, uh, Manet has taken a sort of classical subject or tradition and updated it for his own time. He has modernized um, this subject of the reclining female nude. He has stripped away the veil of mythology and instead presents us with a shockingly real woman. And in doing so, he asks the viewer to consider the reality of the situation. Why would a woman be naked and on display like this? Well, one answer, because she is a prostitute. In France in the 19th century, Olympia was a common name for a prostitute. And Manet has taken this a step further and depicted her as a real woman. Um, he's taken away all indications of a mythological figure and given us a woman who is thin, or at least by the standards of the time, um, and probably poor. Now, Olympia's pose would have seemed somewhat confrontational here because she stares out at the viewer in a rather intense or assertive way. And people in this time were used to seeing much more passive women with voluptuous bodies and docile expressions, uh, more akin to what we see in Titian's Venus of Urbino. Um, so where Venus is soft and curvaceous, Olympia is flat and angular. Olympia has a stark black outline and there's really hardly any shading or modeling of her flesh to give the sense of three dimensionality or volume. Manet is really emphasizing that this is a painting on a canvas and he is you know, consistently unmasking these illusions. This is not a glimpse into reality. This is not a mythological woman. Um, this is a painting on a canvas of a real woman in modern times. Um, now, again, people were used to much more passive 
um, sort of uh, accepting female figures like Titian's Venus, but Olympia's gaze is somewhat uncomfortable. And she's positioned so that she is slightly elevated and looks down upon the viewer um, just a bit. Um, note the differences in color as well, where um, where Venus is warm and rich, Olympia is cold and harsh. And where Venus's sleeping dog maybe connotes ideas of domesticity and loyalty, Olympia's black cat with its arched back and sort of hissing nature would have been seen as a symbol of promiscuity or even um, sort of a vivacious sexuality. So here we have a more contemporary example of um, an artist revisiting this uh, theme of the reclining female nude. This is the Japanese artist Yasumasa Morimura. Um, and so this self-portrait from about 1989 um, uses digital processes that allowed the artist to play the characters of both Olympia and her servant. Um, so the resulting photograph is one of a series in which the artist impersonates famous female icons from Western culture, and he transcends the ideas of race, gender, and ethnicity. So now the hand placement takes on um, greater significance because it disguises the truth of the artist's um, biological sex or his masculinity. Um, the textiles of the earlier pieces have been replaced with a traditional Japanese kimono. And then the cat at the foot of the bed has been replaced with a porcelain lucky cat, um, which is a figurine commonly found in Japanese restaurants and shops as sort of a talisman of good fortune. And so Morimura's reclining nude updates this theme with current technology and raises very important questions about identity. Um, he sort of suggests that appearances can be deceptive and that race and gender are artificial or social constructs. Um, we should not make assumptions about identity um, and that our understanding of who we are is very much influenced by the past. In the late 20th century, many artists began deliberately focusing on trying to challenge preconceived notions about the human body, and in particular, female bodies. Um, the British painter Jenny Saville is an artist who has chosen a somewhat unconventional approach to depicting the female body, um, and she says that she uses her own body as a prop that she is, quote, willing to distort and manipulate. Um, her works comment on the conflicted relationship that women often have with their own bodies. Um, now, Seville has described herself as being anti-beauty, and by this she means that she focuses on exaggerating bodily elements that society has often or generally deems as being unsightly or um, unwanted. In this monumental nude self-portrait titled Branded from 1992, um, we see Seville with her head sort of barely squeezed into the frame. Her breasts and her stomach are far more prominent at this sort of strange angle. Um, she glances down at her own body with a look of disgust or disdain and pinches this roll of flesh on her stomach. Um, the odd colors of her skin are based upon um, photographs and medical illustrations of various flesh tones, uh, bruises, dimples, pockmarks, etc., um, sort of flaws or um, problems on human skin. And then she's also inscribed the body here with um, various words. We see things like supportive, decorative, delicate, petite, irrational, and more. Um, and so this image, this figure, um, it's meant to counter contemporary society's bias towards uh, thin women. And it's commenting, again, on this conflicted relationship that women often have with their own bodies. 
and on society's unreasonable expectations of how they should appear in order to be considered acceptable or attractive. French performance artist Orlan takes this idea even further by adopting her own body as the literal medium for her work. Um, beginning in the 1990s, she underwent a series of plastic surgeries that transformed her appearance, and she documented the process. The operating room became the stage of her performance. She was the star, the medical team was the cast, and the costumes used were created by famous fashion designers. During the procedures, she was only given local anesthetics so that she could remain conscious, and she often read out loud from philosophical and poetic texts. Um, video cameras in the operating rooms transmitted live feeds to CBS News, um, to the Sandra Guerin Gallery in New York City, and to the Center Georges Pompadour in Paris. Um, she also documented the stages of healing after these uh, various procedures. Her final form was that of a composite woman modeled after numerous famously beautiful depictions of women. She modeled her chin after Botticelli's Venus, her mouth after depictions of the Roman deity Diana in French Renaissance paintings, um, her nose after Psyche, the mythical lover of Cupid, and her brow after da Vinci's Mona Lisa. She says that this work aims to intervene in historical representations of women in art by actively determining her own appearance. Um, she's trying to comment on ways technology empowers us to transcend human limitations, to critique the cult of beauty that imposes unfair standards on women, to make a statement about the impossibility of physical perfection, even in an age where plastic surgery is pretty routine. And her extreme measures really expose the tyranny of society's preconceptions about physical appearances and the extreme uh, insistence on stereotypical notions of female beauty. And by taking possession of her own body and asserting her right to do with it as she sees fit, she is directly challenging um, these standards. So in performance art, the human body or its actions become the artwork. It is the body as the material or the medium um, or the art object rather than simply the subject. Um, the human form in action is meant to engage the viewer's various senses through movement, expression, sight, smell, etc. Um, oftentimes, performance art activates the surrounding space that is shared with the audience, and so it becomes an entire experience. Um, these types of artworks are not fixed or static or permanent. They can really only be preserved or re-examined indirectly through documents um, such as writings, photos, or um, videos. And so these often have um, sort of an element that reminds us that time passes during the performance. And so remember that the photos, the videos, the documents, etc., those are not the artworks, it's the performance itself that is the artwork. In some cases, however, the performance art can also create art objects. Um, so here we have the artist Eve Klein. He is inspired by martial arts, um, specifically judo. And he started using women's bodies as the vehicle for applying paint. These were public performances that were accompanied by um, an orchestra. They would create monochrome compositions, and during the performance, the orchestra would play a single chord um, for maybe about 20 minutes, and then there would be 20 minutes of silence, then another chord, then another um, 20 minutes of silence, and so on. And so here you can see some of the final art objects that were produced through these performances. The artist Janine Anthony used her own body and actions for the basis of her performances. Um, here is a work from 1993 titled Loving Care, in which she mopped the floor with her own hair after dipping it into a bucket of hair dye. Um, 
you know, both of these things are considered traditionally feminine actions, um, dyeing your hair, but also um, ideas of domestic activities like cleaning, cooking, etc. Um, and so we have ideas of domesticity, of femininity, and by doing this performance, she is sort of reclaiming her own space and her own agency. Here we have Yoko Ono. She is a performance and conceptual artist from Japan who settled in New York in the 1960s. Um, this particular performance is titled Cut Piece. She first performed this in Japan in 1964 and then repeated it in New York City in 1965 at Carnegie Hall. Um, so for this performance, Ono sat passively on a stage while members of the audience were invited to use the provided sewing shears to cut away bits of her clothing and take with them. Now the performance was charged with implicit violence and eroticism as more and more of her body was revealed by the deliberate actions of the audience. Now, this wasn't necessarily considered feminist at the time, but Yoko Ono has since said that this performance was meant to be against ageism, racism, sexism, and violence. Another example is Chris Burden's performance titled Shoot from 1971, where he stood in an art gallery and had his friend shoot him in the arm with a rifle. Now remember, these are photographs of the performance. The photographs are not the artworks. The performance was the artwork. Now, this might seem a little crazy, but if we think about the context of this time, what was going on? Well, in the 1970s, the Vietnam War was one of the most uh, controversial issues in America. There were lots of arguments about whether we should or should not be involved. Um, and so Chris Burden is sort of taking this idea of guns or of shooting out of the context of war and forcing the viewer to consider it differently when it's not, um, you know, when it's not associated with war or specifically the Vietnam War, do we see it differently? Um, he's also using his own body to express this concept and to explore the idea of how um, when we break the body's physical limitations, we in turn break the mind's limitations. Um, and so putting our bodies through extreme pain or ecstasy um, or transformations can cause us to see things differently as well. Here we have Vito Acconci, the performance and conceptual artist. Um, this was his following piece from 1969. It was part of a series uh, titled Street Works. Um, and this was a 23-day activity. So every day from October 3rd to October 25th, 1969, he would go out and choose a person, um, basically at random on the streets of New York City in a new location each day, and then he would follow that person wherever he or she went, um, usually until they reached a private place. Now, sometimes this would only last a couple of minutes. I believe the longest was he followed someone for nine hours, and then he had a photographer following him and documenting this experience. Um, this was part of a series of conceptual events which were sponsored by um, the Architectural League of New York, um, which was going on at the time, and so it required doing a piece using a street in New York City. Um, now, why would he choose to follow people for this piece? Well, he's thinking about the language of our bodies in public spaces. In one sense, he's sort of submitting his own movements uh, to that of others, kind of connecting his body to that of other people, um, and showing how our bodies are always sort of subjected to external forces. Um, in another sense, and according to his own notes, he's adding himself to another person. He's giving up control over his own body and he's using both of their bodies as objects of art to explore these various ideas. 
And this was also just part of the revolution that was performance art that was happening in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, it brought art out of the gallery and into the street to sort of explore real issues such as space, time, and the physical human body. Anna Mendieta was a Cuban-born artist who was sent to Iowa in 1961 through Operation Peter Pan. Um, this was the relocation of 14,000 Cuban kids after 1959 when Castro and communism took over the country of Cuba. Um, Mendieta was rather traumatized by this. She was haunted throughout her life by a sense of personal dislocation, and her artworks tend to reveal a need for a deeper connection to her physical surroundings. Um, she was interested in the natural elements and biological cycles, and she was inspired by other performance artists and um, traditions associated with Afro-Cuban Santeria practices, um, but her works are also very autobiographical. Um, she usually situated her body in various outdoor environments, um, sometimes on the ground, here in front of a tree, um, or in sort of this rocky ravine covered in um, plants, um, sometimes on a sandy beach, various places. And then she works to connect her own body to the location. Um, so in the Tree of Life series, she invites the tree to absorb her and connect her to the earth as the maternal source of life. Um, and so she did over 200 of these um, types of performances or series, and her body often leaves somewhat of an imprint or trace of her own form on nature. Um, she was once quoted as saying, through my earth body sculptures, I become one with the earth. I become an extension of nature, and nature becomes an extension of my body. This obsessive act of reasserting my ties with the earth is really the reactivation of primeval beliefs in an omnipresent female force. The after image of being encompasses with the womb is a manifestation of my thirst for being. The last performance artist that we'll look at here is the Serbian performance artist Marina Abramovic. Um, she started performing in the 1970s, and she uses her body as the subject and the medium of her performances. Um, she typically tests her physical, mental, and emotional limits in a quest for heightened consciousness, transcendence, and self-transformation. Um, her performances are characterized by endurance, pain, and repetitive behaviors. Um, so there is a link to watch um, a documentary titled The Artist is Present um, about Marina Abramovic and a performance that she did in 2010, um, and you guys will write a short response to that, but we'll look at a couple other examples of her works here as well. So this work was titled Rhythm 5, and it's from 1974. Um, and these are four photographs from the performance. Once again, let me just remind you, the photos are not necessarily the artwork, but the performance itself was the artwork. Um, but this was a 90-minute performance in which um, she created a star shape made out of wood shavings on the floor, and then she covered that in gasoline and lit it on fire. Uh, she then spent time uh, walking in circles around the burning star, trimming her fingernails and her hair, and dropping the trimmings into the fire. Then she entered the star and laid down within it. Um, however, due to the lack of oxygen and the amount of smoke within the center of the star, she lost consciousness, and when her body relaxed, her leg fell into the fire and her clothes caught on fire, and the audience ultimately intervened and pulled her to safety. Now, after this performance, you might think she would never perform again. However, she said that it was then that she, quote, realized the subject of my work should be the limits of my body. I would push, excuse me, I would use performance to push my mental and physical limits beyond consciousness. 
Rhythm Zero was a six-hour performance in Naples in 1974 in which Abramovich stood completely still in a room and the audience was invited to do with her whatever they wished using one of the 72 objects that she had placed out on a table. Um, these objects included things like a rose, a feather, perfume, honey, bread, but also things like a scalpel, nails, and a gun loaded with one bullet. Now, this performance was meant to be exemplary of her belief that confronting physical pain and exhaustion was important in making a person completely present and aware of themselves. And she also wanted the viewers to become active participants in the performance and to sort of see just how far the public would go. Now the performance started off relatively tame, but by the third hour she, um, excuse me, her clothes had been cut off. By the fourth hour, some members of the audience had begun to cut her skin, while others tried to protect her. They wiped her tears and tried to place items of clothing back on her body. But then one audience member took the loaded gun and placed it in her hand and made her hold it to her own head with her finger on the trigger. Um, a fight broke out amongst the audience members, those who wanted to protect her versus those who did not. And eventually the gallery owner stepped in and announced that the performance was over. At this point, Marina Abramovich began to move around the space like a person again. And she said that the audience was suddenly unable to face her and they all bolted from the room. They had all objectified her to such an extreme state that they couldn't bear to look at her in the face as a human being any longer. Here we have a work in which Abramovich and her partner Ulai are both holding on to a bow and arrow. He holds the string and the arrow and she holds on to the bow and they both lean backwards and they stayed this way for four minutes and ten seconds and this performance was meant to explore the fragile line between life and death. Um, if if he were to lose his grip or his balance and fall backwards and let go, um, that arrow would be shot directly at her heart. Um, now during the performance, they both wore small microphones on their chests that picked up the sound of their heartbeats, which became much more intense as the performance went on. Abramovich and Ulai met first in 1976, and they began um, their relationship. They lived a nomadic lifestyle together and traveled and performed across Europe for several years. Um, this particular work, Relation in Time, involved spending 17 hours with their hair tied together, um, but they explore other extremes in other works as well, including running into each other full steam, naked, um, slapping each other, screaming in each other's faces. Um, here in this performance from 1977 titled Breathing In, Breathing Out, they spent 19 minutes with their mouths sort of um, just centimeters apart, breathing in and breathing out the same air. And they also did performances like this in which they stood um, both completely nude for 90 minutes within this already very narrow hallway of, I believe, an art gallery and forced um, the visitors to sort of squeeze in between their naked bodies. Um, in 1983, Abramovich and Ulai began their ultimate collaboration. Um, they announced their project titled The Lovers, in which they proposed to become the first people to walk the length of the Great Wall of China. Each would start at the opposite ends, and they planned to meet in the middle, each having walked about 1,242 miles, and they planned to get married once they had met in the middle. Now, it took several years to plan this project and to get the permissions and things. Um, they began their walks on the 30th of March, 1988, from either end of the Great Wall. Ninety days later, when they met in the middle, they realized they had grown apart 
And after spending a little bit of time together and giving a short press conference, they each went their separate ways and they didn't see or speak to each other for 22 years. They were reunited briefly at her performance in 2010 titled The Artist is Present. So when you watch the film, you'll get to see um, this particular interaction between the two of them, and you'll get to learn a lot more about um, the way she approaches performance art.